Romans chapter 8, uh, we will be reading from verse 12 until verse 17 this morning. Romans 8, 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let's commit our time in this text to the Lord. Heavenly Father, once again, uh, our service does not look uh, the way we want it to look. Uh, an empty church is uh, not what we want to have as a group. And yet, Lord, we find ourselves together, even though we are apart within this text, singing your praises, listening to your word read, and prayers being prayed. And so we ask that you would unite us in, in your Holy Spirit, as a group, you would teach us, mold us, shape us in the image of Jesus Christ, so that when we gather again, we may celebrate the work you are doing in our lives for your glory. Amen. Once again, uh, it's important to uh, set our feet in uh, the chapter, in our context within Romans before we move on. Uh, one of the things about going through a book the size of uh, the book of Romans and, uh, and do, doing so at the pace that we're doing is that often we can lose sort of where we are at in the book because we're you know, taking three or four or five verses at a time and, and we can be uh, too narrow in our focus. And so that's, that's why we need to continue to remind ourselves of, of where Paul has gone and, and where he is moving to as well. And so if we go back into chapter 7, uh, the end of that chapter, the second half of the chapter, we remember that what Paul was doing there was reminding each and every believer that their Christian walk is going to be an intense struggle with the sin that so easily entangles us. Uh, we talked about it, we used a, a brief image, I think, of of it being an unwanted tenant in a house or, or a squatter who refuses to leave. He's, he's not welcome there. This isn't his home. Uh, but he's made his residence there or continues to be there even though the house is under new ownership. And Paul goes on to say that even in the midst of this struggle, this battle with sin, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So even if you battle with sin and temptation every day, there's no condemnation for you because the fullness of the condemnation for your sin, even in the midst of struggle, has been laid upon Christ. And there's nothing left then for you. And this is entirely on account of the work of Christ. We are in Christ, and therefore Paul tells us in, verse, in chapter 8 that we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law in Christ and we're told that to be in Christ means that we are in possession of or the uh, put it the way Paul does the spirit has dwelt within us he has taken up residence within us and as a result of that we are no longer to walk in the way that we did walk we are now to walk in accordance with the spirit who is now in us walk in the flesh, as we did when we were in Adam, Paul reminded us, is to hate God, and it's to be unwilling and unable to obey his commandments. But Paul's whole point thus far in chapter 8 is that we are not in the flesh. We are not in Adam because we have been united with Christ. And this union with Christ is, is also, me, also means that we are in possession of the Holy Spirit. And we are to walk in the Holy Spirit. And that has consequences, which Paul is now going to explain a little bit in verses 12 to 17. Now, we remember that as we read chapter 8, there are no imperatives in this entire chapter, even though the chapter is incredibly 
uh, personal and practical. There are exhortations here, but there aren't any direct imperatives. But his words in these particular verses serve as an implicit imperative for Christians to, to act in a certain way. What, what he, he wants for us to understand is that you need to possess certain knowledge of yourself. We, we've come to understand that's Paul's way. He lays out certain truths. He lays out certain realities. We, we've recognized those as indicatives. Paul says there are certain things that are true of you. What God has done for you. What God is doing in you. Where God is leading you. And those things don't change. But what they do is they form the foundation upon which we stand in order to live a life reflective of what God has done in us. And so we've said that the imperatives ground the indicatives. We stand on them and then we obey God. And even though there are no clear, distinct, do this, don't do that kind of terminology in this passage, there is a distinct reality that Paul wants us to live out based upon the truth that he is outlining for us. He is, he is telling us the truth about ourselves and in doing so challenging us to live the way we ought to in light of those realities. Simply stated, because the Holy Spirit, who is our possession, gives us life, Trans, uh, gives us a newness. We must no longer live like we did when we were in the flesh, in Adam, whatever terminology you want to take from the previous chapters. But there's more to it than this, as Paul is going to remind us in these verses. The same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in us, enables us to live our lives to God, enables us to follow Christ and obey the law, but he also brings us into unique relationship with God. Therefore, verses 12 to 17 serve as an exhortation for justified and sanctified believers to obey and behave in a way that is, in, that is fitting of who they are as adopted sons and daughters of God. As a consequence of the life given to us in the Holy Spirit, we are supposed to live in a manner consistent with being royalty, the sons and daughters of the kings. Paul is clear about the fact that because we're no longer under the dominion of Adam, we're obligated to put that to death. We're no longer to sell ourselves to that sin. We're no longer obligated to it. But we're to live as the freed men that we are. Because we have life in the Spirit, we are now able to put to death, to put down the deeds of the flesh. And so in these uh, short four or five verses, we are going to see the two sides of sanctification that we've spoken about throughout the book of Romans thus far. There are two sides of the same coin. You can't really have one without the other. Uh, there's mortification of sin we've talked about. That's the, the putting to death of the old self through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then we've talked about vivification, which is being made new, being made alive in Christ, again, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so we see then that sanctification entails both the killing off of the old self, the sinful self, and the continual killing off as we live life to God. So we were sanctified and we are being sanctified. We are we we had sin killed in us, but we continue to kill sin. We have been made a new creation, but we continue to live to God as new creations. Now there's one more thing we need to understand about these verses and the ones that come after them. So when we get to, to verse 12 in chapter 8, there's a bit of a transition as Paul is sort of moving in a related but, but new direction as he explores the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. They begin a, a, a section of encouragement and comfort. 
that Paul is offering to believers. In, in verses 12 to 17, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit makes us alive and, and ensures our position as children of God. Then when we get to verses 18 to 25, we're going to see Paul show us how he uses our present situation, our present sufferings, for our glory in the future and his glory in the future. Verses 28 to 30 uh, of Romans 8 shows us how we are certain that God's promise will be fulfilled in us and to us. And then at the end of the chapter, verses 31 to 39, we're reminded of how much God is for us, how secure we are in our justification, and how we can become more than conquerors each and every day, even though, going back to chapter 7, so many days of our lives we feel just beaten down and defeated. And so all of the content of chapter 8 up until this point, but really from here on, is designed to encourage and comfort and strengthen us as we live in the midst of the struggle that 7, 14, and following has laid out. So let's get into this chapter. If you uh, are in possession of the uh, the bulletin that Iris sent out this morning, you'll see an outline in there. It's really simple, easy passage to follow. The first thing Paul wants to remind us in the first couple of verses, verses 12 to 13, is that we live in order to live. Now the transition at the beginning of verse 12 is Paul's way of telling us that what he's about to write are consequences of the previous 11 verses. He says, so then, brothers, so then, I want you to understand that in light of verse, the first 11 verses, the truths I've laid out, this is the natural consequence. This is what you need to do. And what Paul has just said in verse 11 in particular is that we have life through the Holy Spirit. And this means that we are now no longer under the obligation to live in the old ways. We are now under an, the obligation to live according to the Holy Spirit. Paul says we're not debtors to the flesh anymore in verse 12. Now we all know what debt is. And we all know what the obligations are when we incur debt. For example, a mortgage. Uh, when you have a mortgage, you are obligated to pay that mortgage. You agree to a monthly payment. You agree to interest, whatever. And if you don't pay that mortgage, you also agree at time of signing the consequences that will come for not doing so. And so you know that you have to pay the debt or face the consequences. But when you pay off the mortgage, the bank then has no more power over you. They, they have no right to ask you for any more money. When, when your mortgage reaches zero, they can't come to you and say, uh, you owe us another monthly payment or you owe us more interest because the debt's paid. It's over. It's done. Uh, you're free from the obligation of the previous debt on your home. And Paul is using this kind of, of monetary imagery to explain our spiritual situation. He says you're not obligated to the flesh anymore. Now remember when Paul says flesh, he's not talking about the meat and bones of our body. He's talking about the flesh in the same way that he talked about the realm of being in Adam. It, it it describes a, a time period, a realm, a, a, a time of our existence that no longer holds true. And he says that, that now that we are in the Holy Spirit, we don't have any obligations to our former way of life. We owe it nothing. Because our debt to the flesh, the sin, the law, whatever imagery he's used in the past, has been paid, not by us, that's impossible, but he's been clear throughout the first six chapters of Romans that the debt has been paid exclusively and entirely by Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled the obligations associated with the flesh, and so as a result, we are freed from any obligations that sin, death, the flesh, being in Adam, whatever you want to say, have on us. And as a, on account of that, 
we do not owe them anything. So don't live as though you do. Don't live as though you're obligated to the flesh and its goals because you don't, you don't owe it anything. And so the monetary imagery is actually quite beautiful here. Think about it. If you're free from the mortgage, right? You've zeroed out your mortgage. How many of you would go to the bank and say, you know what? I really like having this money coming out of my bank every month. I've gotten used to it. It's something I'm comfortable with. Can you please just continue to take that money out of the bank? Well, I don't think any of one of us would do. Well, just for the record, if any of you would do that, give it to me instead. Well, okay, let me be more noble. Give it to the church instead. But none of us would do that. None of us would continue to pay a debt once the debt has been paid. And this is how Paul wants us to think about our spiritual life. He wants to make it clear, though, that because we're free from the obligation of, or we're free from the obligation of being in Adam, that, do, that, that means now that we're placed under the obligation of Jesus Christ. We are not without any obligation at all. It's just our obligations have now changed. We're no longer debtors to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. But we are debtors to Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, one thing we do need to note about this particular teaching that Paul is laying out is that this is the strength of what he is saying. Now, he's used the language of of slavery in the past, that we're slaves to righteousness. He'll talk later on about being slaves to Christ, you know, elsewhere in his epistles. And at this point, the idea is a strong one as well. It's obligation. He says you're not obligated to the flesh. You are, are however, obligated to obey Christ, to follow the Holy Spirit. He's not just simply saying, hey, you know what? You should obey Christ because you're really thankful, you know? You're really thankful for what Christ has done for you, and out of that depth of gratitude, you obey him. No, he's saying much stronger things than that. He's saying, listen, you are obligated. You are in debt. Again, think of the monetary language, right? You, are, you now owe God your obedience, your allegiance, your life. As believers in Christ, we're united with Christ and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And now we are obligated, we owe God a certain way of life. And he's going to explain to us in just a few verses that one of the reasons why we're obligated to live this way is because we're adopted. The doctrine of adoption is going to come into clear focus, and that is one of the grounding realities of our new existence through which Paul can say, you owe God a change of life. So in verse 13 then, Paul is going to give us the reason why we need to continue to be active in the mortification of our sins, in putting to death sin. And he explains very simply, that sinful living is always inseparably linked to death. You want to keep on sinning, it's an inseparable, uh, inevitable reality that you are going to find death in that. But, if you choose to put to death sin, that is always going to lead you to life. John Stott puts it this way. It's, it's, it's really quite simple. He says, there's a kind of life which leads to death, and there's a kind of death which leads to life. It's a beautiful statement. You want to live a life of sin? It's going to lead you to death. But if you want to put to death sin, it's going to lead you to life. That's Paul's point. The point of verse 13 is to identify the reality that our sanctification always involves the activity of putting to death sin. It's something in which we must always be engaged. And so these verses are present tense, indicating that, that this is an activity that we need to engage in all the time, moment by moment. This is a, a, a moment by moment, day-to-day -day thing that has to be engaged by us. It has to be an active part 
of our life. We're constantly to be killing sin as we see it in our lives. The realities of who we are in Christ, which Paul has been really at pains to explain throughout Romans, do not lead us to a, a mentality of sort of let go and let God. It doesn't lead us to this sort of, uh, you know, relaxed sense of sin that, you know, I'm saved, I'm justified, I'm sanctified, I can just sort of relax, you know, God will take care of everything, no problem. No, Paul is saying that who you are in Christ leads you to a strong, grace-dependent, faith-filled activity on your part. Again, you stand on the foundations, the, the truths of who you are in Christ, and then from there, you can engage with the mortification of sin. Those who have died with Christ by virtue of their union with Him, which we saw at the beginning of chapter 6, are going to daily crucify their sinful nature, putting to death the evil actions associated with that part of them that is no longer in control. You don't owe the flesh, your, your being in Adam, anything. So put it to death. Be killing it whenever it pops up. And Paul tells us that what we're to put to death are the deeds of the body. Now, again, we need to make sure that we're understanding what Paul is saying here and what he isn't. Uh, it, it could be a confusing phrase if we just take it literally, right? We, we might just assume that, oh, what Paul is saying is that uh, the stuff that I do in my physical body, I need to put to death. So, so things that are associated with my actions, my words, those are the things that I need to put to death. But if it's going on in my head, if it's an attitude, a disposition, whatever, that doesn't actually kind of come out, doesn't see its fruition in activity, that, then that's totally fine. But that would be to miss the way Paul speaks about body and flesh and all the rest up until this point in Romans. We know that when Paul speaks that way, he's most often referring to the reality of two realms or two ages that we talked about. So being in Adam and the flesh and being in the body, that, that's associated with a realm that is no longer true for us. We've been removed from that. We've been placed in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're a new creation. We live our life according to the Holy Spirit. So he's not telling us to only kill those sins which show up in our physical bodies. Uh, he's telling us to put to death whatever is characterized by our fleshly existence, by our bodily existence. While we're in the body, we're going to struggle with the flesh. It's going to pop up. And he says, you've got you to battle that. You've got to fight that. You've got to put that to death. Anything that characterizes his sinful nature needs to be actively put to death by us. He's telling us to make sure that we recognize that we owe that nothing but our active mortification. The only thing you owe the flesh is to constantly seek to kill it in your life. Now, when you hear stuff like this, it's only natural for us to ask the question, okay, Paul, sounds pretty good. Put to death the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. We owe the spirit. So how do I do that? How do I put to death the deeds of the body? Well, Paul tells us how. Although it's not with the kind of sort of five-step program that we've come to expect uh, or, or maybe hope that he would give us, he tells us that we mortify sin by the Spirit. So he tells us, listen, if you want to kill sin, you don't do it on your own. Uh, mortification of sin is not me standing up against my flesh. Uh, it's not me standing up against who I was in Adam, against my temptations. It's the Holy Spirit that stands up to the flesh on my behalf. It's, it's not me versus the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit or sorry, me versus the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit versus the flesh. And so that, that puts to light what God is doing in me through the Holy Spirit, and I am to allow His presence, His power, to do that which I cannot do on my own. So again, we, we can picture it this way. 
right? Picture a, a boxer or an MMA fighter. And when he enters the ring or the octagon, he's in there by himself. Where's the trainer? Where's all of his team? Well, they're, they're outside the ring. They're in the corner. And all they can do during the fight is just to, to bark out instructions, to bark out encouragement. Th that's not the picture that Paul wants us to have. It's not, it's not me fighting with the flesh in the octagon of my life and then every once in a while looking over my shoulder and, and hearing the Holy Spirit yell out, you know, Bob, weave, don't, you know, whatever. Don't do this, don't do that. Get on the ground, etc., etc. That's not how it works. It's the Holy Spirit who fights for us. So Paul isn't advocating, we want to put this in sort of theological terms, he's not advocating work salvation. Right? We, we know this already. Paul hasn't advocated work salvation in terms of our justification, in terms of our right standing with God. And he surely isn't going to say, listen, now that you're in, it's all up to you. Now it's work salvation. He's not going to say it's grace by faith in Christ alone to get in, but now it's all you. Not at all. He's saying, listen, your spiritual life from beginning to end, from your justification through your sanctification and into your glorification is all worked in us on account of our union with Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's continue. Let me give you a little bit more about this. I think if we're going to ask that sort of how-to question, that, that question of, okay, how do I put the deeds of the body to death? I think it's proper for us at this point to see verse 13 as a subset of verse 5. I think we need to see those two verses within, uh, a, 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 or with an intimate connection between the two of them. Verse 13 is a subset of verse 5. What does verse 5 tell us? Verse 5 says, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but, and this is where we need to make sure we are understanding Paul properly, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And so it's within that, remember minds isn't just about what you think, it's everything about you. It's your attitude, your dispositions, your worldview, your goals, your purpose for life, your mission, the way you think, etc., etc. Those people with, with that kind of thing that is set on the Spirit are going to then, verse 13, be able to put to death the deeds of the body. The two are intimately related. Your life, your mind, everything who you are has to be set on the Spirit for mortification to be possible. Mortification of sin is only possible when your focus is on the right things, the things of Christ, the things of redemption, the things that characterize the Holy Spirit. And so here again, we see that our sanctification involves mortification and vivification. They're two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. Killing sin and living life to God are intimately related. We're made to hate sin in our life and to work against it only when we fix our minds on things above and not on earthly things. Only when our minds are renewed can we see sin for what it truly is. Only by making sure that our entire selves are consumed by the things of God can we see that all other things pale in comparison and need to be jettisoned. And so what Paul is telling us is that we need to have a, a different orientation of life. This isn't about five steps. This isn't about checking off boxes. This is about making sure that our minds, our entire selves, are focused on the right things. That we think gospel-centered thoughts, not law-centered thoughts. Because it's easy at this point to, to think, okay, if, if I'm going to battle sin, then I immediately need to do certain things. Because if I do this, 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 and this, then God will love me. That means I've killed sin. And that means God loves me more. And because I've killed sin, God loves me more. That means I'm going to get life. I'm going to get something 
out of it at the other end. But that's not, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul says, listen, look at what God has done for you. Right? That, that's the point of the first 11 verses of chapter 8 before he gets to verse 12. Look at what God has done for you. Look what he's promised you in Jesus Christ. And now, now you can ask, how should I live? Only when you understand what God has done for you, who you are in Jesus Christ, what he's promised to deliver to you in the past, in the present, and in the future, can you actually stand and live the way you're supposed to live. Mortification and vivification go hand in hand to sanctify us. They mutually feed off each other. They mutually encourage each other. They mutually grow within us. There's no fancy way to do this. There's no immediate way to do this. There's no, there's no instant fixes for the believer. Uh, we're to take our temptations to the gospel and in the gospel find victory over them. Take our temptations to the, to the cross and to, and to recognize they've been defeated there. We're to use the gospel-focused means of grace to increase our love of God. Things like meditation on God's Word and prayer in God's Word, with God's Word. Submitting yourself to the true preaching of the Word. Pursuing discipleship with other people within that context as we open our lives for other people to see what's going on so that they can minister the preached Word and the Word of God and prayer within our lives. That is is how you become more sanctified. That's how you become alive to God and kill sin in your life. These are all simple things. That, but they make a monumental difference over the course of time. Because the Holy Spirit is in these things. God has promised that His Holy Spirit is in His Word. And will minister through His Word to us. He's in the preaching of the Word. He's in prayer. He's in these spiritual discipleship relationships. So only as we do the necessary work, if I can use that terminology, of doing what God asks us to do, can we expect for our lives to be lived properly to God and sin to be mortified. We must, to borrow Jesus' language... We must be active to gouge out and cut off. So don't ever get the sense that, that sanctification for the believer is passive, that we just wait for the Holy Spirit to do it. No, there's, there's far too much language in the New Testament, in Jesus and Paul and all the other writers, to suggest an activity of mortifying sin. Jesus says, if, it, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. If your, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. All of the sinfulness in your lives need to be treated with that sort of aggressiveness. We need to, as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, pull out our sin, look at it, denounce it, hate it for what it is. It's an activity that we do, empowered by the Holy Spirit, according to His means of grace. And so if our temptation comes to us through what we see, handle, or places that we go, then we must be ruthless in not looking, not touching, and not going there. And so in doing so, we are able to, at some level, control the very approaches of sin that will lead to our temptation. But all the while that we do this, we recognize that on the other side of it, if Christ is not beautiful to us, sin will not be ugly to us. You see, you've got to have both. You have to look at the beauty of Christ in order to see how ugly your sin is. We need to recognize who we are in Christ so that we can recognize what we shouldn't be engaging in as adopted sons and daughters of Christ. The two go hand in hand. We set our minds on the things of the Holy Spirit so that we can see sin for what it is. And through Christ and His presence within us, we're given both the desire and the strength to put our sin to death. Mortification and vivification go hand in hand to sanctify us 
and they are all empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they are all based upon our union with Christ. And they all involve us submitting and being active. Verses 14 and 16. Paul wants to continue to drive home the reality of what the possession of the Holy Spirit means for you and I as believers and then where that takes us. He's building that foundation upon which we stand, from which we can mortify and vivify our our souls. And he speaks here about the doctrine of divine adoption. The word adoption used here or adopting or adopted in its various forms is only used by Paul in the New Testament. And he only uses that terminology five times and three of them are found right here in the book of Romans. And it's a very useful idea for Paul because it signifies being granted the full rights and privileges of of sonship in a family to which you do not belong. By nature, you have no claims on that family, but on account of adoption, you now become a son. Through adoption, Paul says, the believer is admitted to the heavenly family. We have no rights to be a part of the heavenly family, but because we're adopted by our heavenly father, we now have sonship. Now, to appreciate what Paul is speaking about, it's important for us to understand adoption in first century you know greco-roman culture Uh, adoption usually occurred when a wealthy adult uh, male uh, had no heir for his estate Uh, he had no children uh, that he could give all of his wealth to and so what he would do then would adopt someone as his heir now it could be a child could be a youth could even have been an adult in Roman culture. And the moment that that adoption occurred, several things were immediately true of the new family member, the new son or daughter. First, his old debts and his legal obligations were paid. They were done, over. Second, that person got a new name and was instantly the heir of all that the father possessed. Third, and this goes back to number one, the new father became instantly liable for all of his actions. So any debts that the son or daughter would have brought in, the new father was obligated to pay. But if that person had any crimes or anything like that sort of attached to their account, the new father became liable for that. And then number four, The positive for the the son or the daughter is that, or positive for the father, maybe I should say, is that the new son or daughter were obligated to honor him, to obey him, and to please him as his son or daughter. So the father had to give a lot to get this adoption to work. But once the adoption came, the son, the daughter had new obligations. They were to honor, obey, and submit to the will of the Father. Now, what makes us a child of God? Well, the beginning of verse 14 is clear. What makes us a child of God is the possession of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit dwelling within us. Everyone with the Holy Spirit is adopted by the Heavenly Father. And the one adopted by the Father will not fail to indwell the believer, and that believer will be then be led by the Holy Spirit. Now this phrase, led by the Spirit, which Paul uses here at the beginning of verse 14, is, uh, is a phrase that has been skewed within Christianity. It's, it's taken on sort of its own life, and it's become a really messed up sort of way of thinking that's almost... Uh, makes the Holy Spirit sort of akin to the force in Star Wars. It's almost become a, almost a New Age concept where we're led by the Holy Spirit. But no, everybody uses the phrase, but nobody really knows what it means. And often this kind of language has to do with, you know, really practical things, but in really weird ways. You know, we have to make a decision, who we marry, what job we're going to take, car we're going to buy, blah, blah, blah. And so we rely on the, 
leading of the Holy Spirit to guide us to the right person, place, or thing. Even though we would really have any biblical basis upon which to, to, to sort of think that way, uh, nor would we really be able to dis, you know, sort of discuss it theologically why we've come to that conclusion. But here in verse 14, Paul tells us exactly what being led by the Spirit means. He says that being led by the Spirit means that we triumph over our sin. Notice the connection between verse 13 and verse 14. Verse 14 begins with the word for. It's a, it's a gar in Greek, which means that what Paul is doing is he's drawing on what he's just said. He, he's, he's going to bring us a conclusion here based upon his, what he's just said in verse 13. Now in verse 13, Paul says that with the Holy Spirit, we really can triumph over our sin. The sin that so easily entangles us, that we battle with, which we saw in chapter 7, can actually be, we can actually triumph over that. And then he explains why this great power over sin is available to us. How can we triumph over sin? Well, we've already talked about it. It's through the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we get the Holy Spirit? Well, on account of our being children of God. And so, being led by the Holy Spirit is, in essence, it, the same thing as putting to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit from verse 13. So, how are believers led by the Holy Spirit? Well, they're led by the Holy Spirit to put to death the deeds of the body. In other words, we're led to hate the things that the Holy Spirit lead, hates. As someone who is led by the Holy Spirit is somebody who recognizes that they have no obligation to the flesh, that they seek to kill sin, and they recognize that as adopted sons and daughters of God, they now have new obligations to live according to the desires of their Father and love the things that He loves. And so a believer that is killing sin and living life to God, Paul says, is led by the Holy Spirit. That's how you know. Verse 15 underlies this, or underlines it. Christians are people who have received the spirit of sonship, not of slavery. Notice several things about what Paul is saying, which are centered around how we have become children of God. He tells us that we've received our sonship. No one is born into a proper relationship with God. We have already come to understand that. The first three chapters of Romans are very, very clear about that. There was a time when we were lost, when we were spiritual orphans, when we were rebels against God, when we hated God. But now, on account of the work of Christ in our life, and we become regenerated and then come to Him by faith, we are now adopted. We receive our adoption from Christ through the Holy Spirit. We've done nothing to make ourselves adoptable. God has chosen to adopt us. He's done it all. Adoption is a legal act on the part of the Father. He has chosen us to adopt us, and it was very costly for Him. To adopt each and every one of us. Because he had to pay our debts, our liabilities, which we owed to sin, the law, the flesh. So, not all of God's creation are God's children. Only those who receive Christ by faith has God adopted and thus given his Holy Spirit as evidence that we are true children of God. Now, being led by the Spirit, because we're sons of God, brings with it some pretty amazing benefits. Uh, Christians not only live and are rescued from sin and death, but we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which means we're not slaves to fear. And we've already come to understand that because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we're led by the Holy Spirit to kill sin and live life to God. And this same Holy Spirit that gives us all of that unites us to Christ in such a way that we are now able to cry out to him the way Christ called out to him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, Father. Now the word cry out here, uh, just to clear it up, doesn't refer to some sort of ecstatic utterance. 
It, it doesn't re re refer to sort of a, a higher level of spiritual awareness, that once you, you get to a high level of spirituality in your life, well then this will just be sort of a, a, a spiritually led sort of cry that you make to God that, that's, that's characteristic of the really mature spiritual people. It's much more simpler, much more mundane kind of terminology that Paul is using. It's essentially related to prayer, I think is probably the best way we could say it. And Paul is indicating here that, that what he's saying is that there's intimacy that comes with being adopted as a child of God in the prayer life of the believer. So being led by the Spirit allows us to pray to God in, in a le at a level of intimacy that would not be possible without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this fervent intimacy results from a bond that is affected by the Holy Spirit between the believer and us. And so we can cry out, we can pray, we can say what we need to say to God. Now at this point, I think it's important for us to clear up a bit of a misunderstanding regarding this word. This word, Abba. It, it, was, an, it was an Aramaic word brought over into the Greek. And, and, and I think that the misunderstanding of this word uh, often clouds a little bit of what Paul is saying here. I think many of us uh, have come to understand that the, that the title, Abba, here is sort of loosely translated in, in English as Papa or Daddy. Uh, now, I hate to burst your bubble, uh, but that's it's not true. It's, it's not accurate. Uh, the term Abba is not best conveyed in, uh, in English by Papa or Daddy, uh, but by the terminology Dear. Uh, dear Father or Precious Father. Father, something, something like that. We don't really have a terminology that, that mirrors it, but, but it, it conveys uh, the, the warmth and the intimacy and the authority of a loving relationship between a child and a father. Paul is, and here's why it's important to make that distinction, because it, Paul is not describing a relationship between the believer and our Heavenly Father as one that is casual or colloquial or chummy, right? Which is the danger when we think of it as Papa or Daddy, that, that there's a casualness to our relationship. What Paul is highlighting instead is something much better than that. He's, he's highlighting the relationship of deep, familial love and intimacy that is now possible between the justified sinner and our holy God, our heavenly Father, our precious Father, our dear Father. This word does not imply something informal between us and God. It demonstrates a deep intimacy which highlights the reality that God is still the Almighty God. He is still the maker of heaven and earth. He is still our Savior and our Redeemer. But that great Almighty God is not distant from us. He has come close to us in Christ Jesus through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And He loves us dearly. Yes, He's our Father, but He's our Heavenly Father. And so we don't just refer to him simply as father, as, as sort of a, a, a term of respect. We can now say, my dear father, my, my precious father, the, the one whom I love and who loves me back. That's what Paul is trying to communicate. That's what the presence of the Holy Spirit brings to us. Verse 16 follows right on the heels of verse 15 and explains to us how it is that believers can confidently cry out with this level of intimacy to God our Father. The sequence is as follows. All those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit are led by the Holy Spirit. As a result of that, we kill sin and we live our lives to God. We are then God's sons or His daughters. And being His sons or daughters... 
we enjoy the unspeakable privilege of an intimate relationship with God because the Holy Spirit who indwells them, leads them, and, con and then confirms them that they are God's children. So this is what Paul wants us to understand, is that the presence of the Spirit in your life one of, its main, one of the main goals of the Holy Spirit is your assurance of salvation as God's child. As he leads you to mortify sin and live life to God, the Holy Spirit continues to witness to you, you are God's child. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are loved by him. You have intimacy with the Heavenly Father. This is who you are. Live like it. It's an encouragement and an exhortation all wrapped up in one. And so Paul is clear that all those who are in Christ through faith are in the Spirit. And that Holy Spirit not only helps them in their, in their spiritual walk to deal with sin and to live life to God, but it bears witness to them of all of the love that the Father has for you as His child. Now this adoption comes with both I've called it the good and the bad in verse 17, but it's probably better to say the good and the just the way it's going to be of our adoption. There's more good news that starts off verse 17. Not only do we enjoy intimate, familial love from our Father, this, this intimacy of relationship as adopted children of God, not only does the Holy Spirit continue to witness to us that we are the child of God and assures us of our salvation, not only are we able to, to put to death the deeds of the flesh because we're led by the Holy Spirit, but because of the work of the Spirit, we also enjoy a new status as well. A status which centers primarily in a new relationship to God. And it is an unbelievable reality. We are now heirs with Christ. As adopted children of God, we are now heirs together with Christ. What an unbelievable thing for Paul to say. So think about it this way. God doesn't say, listen, here, here, here's what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm up here, you know, if we can think it this way. I'm the Savior. I'm the Redeemer. I, I have Jesus Christ. He's my Son. And then all the rest of you are under Him. So I love Him a little bit more than I love you. Right now, I know this is a pathetic illustration, but that, that's not what Paul is saying here when he uses this language. He says that when it comes to our salvation, he's saying, listen, I love you as though you were equal to my son. You are joint heirs. You are co-heirs with Christ. And as a result of that, there's no priority here in this regard. So uh, it's an unbelievable thing for, for him to say. And he's saying that as heirs, we are going to inherit something. We are going to receive something. Now, we understand the basic idea of inheritance, right? Parents die or grandparents die and, and they have a legal document which says, when I die, I want this to go here and this to go there and that to go somewhere else. And that is sort of underlying here. But the idea of inheritance as a Greek conception doesn't quite capture, I think, what Paul is referring to here because we have this idea of sonship and inheritance and blessing embedded in the Old Testament. And it's a little bit different. See, throughout the Old Testament, the inheritance of God's people was connected to redemption. First, it was the land promised to Abraham. But Abraham recognized even himself that the land was symbolic of something greater. It was typological. And later on, we come to understand in the Old Testament that actually the land was typical of what was going to come through the Messiah that the suffering servant of Isaiah, the Messiah, was going to come and bring to God's people a much greater promise than simply a geographical patch of land. That the typology that, Adam reali or that Abraham realized was indeed massive. And so in the later prophets, the, the inheritance of God's people begins to refer to the fullness of their salvation, which 
was going to be secured by the work of the Messiah. And so what Paul does is he reinvents a secular idea, the idea of inheritance, with a distinctly Christian meaning in light of redemptive history and messianic promise. So we then, by, by Paul saying that we are heirs with Christ, Paul is not simply saying that we are receiving property uh, from God on account of the death of Christ. What he's saying is that we are now heirs of all of God's salvific possessions, all of the messianic blessings that Christ has won, we now receive, especially within this context, Paul says, an intimate relationship with God, which is then guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Notice again that we're not just heirs. We're heirs with Christ. Meaning that the believers have been given by the Father to the Son and we are heirs because we are Christ's possession. We are co-heirs with Christ. Because Christ has already received his inheritance by virtue of his resurrection, so will we. Now, again, I've used this picture before, but it is important for us to understand that, that when Christ, uh, and again, this is just a sort of a dumbed-down kind of way of thinking about it, but when, when Christ, Christ and the Heavenly Father are talking and saying, listen, I'm going to go, uh, you know, Father, I'm going to go and I'm going I'm to live my life, I'm going to die on the cross, you're going to raise me from the dead, and that's going to complete the salvation for my people, right? For, for my elect, yep. Okay, so then Christ goes about his business, he lives, he dies, uh, he's in the tomb, he rises again, he ascends to the Heavenly Father, and I can just... Again, using our sanctified imaginations, you know, he goes to the Heavenly Father and says, listen, I, I've done all that we agreed upon, and now I would like my gift. I, I would like you to give me the blessings of my salvation. Well, who are the blessings? Who are the blessings that, that Christ was promised? Well, it's us. It's the elect. It's the believers. And so now Paul is saying, listen, you look at the salvation that Christ received, that is what you are going to receive. Uh, Paul will use the language elsewhere of his being first fruits, right? So look at what Christ has received. Look at everything that he has won, and that is the inheritance that you will receive as well. Truly amazing and wonderful stuff. But you knew this was coming. That awaits us. The inheritance awaits us. There's a way to go yet. We're not yet to the point where we can fully receive all of our blessings in Jesus Christ. The blessings of the future are not yet. They will only come when we are finished with the already. And this means, in a word, suffering. To be, to be in union with Christ is glorious for us. It brings us incredible victory. It bl brings us incredible blessing. It brings us the Holy Spirit who leads us and and who kills sin in our lives and, and helps us to live to God and, and gives us assurance of salvation and, and shows us that, that our salvation is, is going somewhere. It's got a solid foundation. But to be in union with Christ means that we will also be united with Him in His sufferings. If we're co-heirs with Jesus Christ, it also means that we are co-heirs in what Jesus Christ has endured. Jesus himself said this. He says, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Luke 24. He's saying, listen, i got to suffer before I get to my glory. That's just the way it's got to be. And Peter says sort of the same thing, but in reference to us. 1 Peter 4. Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Thus, to participate in Christ's glory, we must share in his sufferings. We share in his sufferings when we are united with Christ and participate in the age to come, even now, in the midst of this present evil age, where the God of this world has blinded the minds of those around us to turn from the gospel and turn against us. To be identified with Christ in this age, in this life, is to be subject to all matter of suffering, including even persecution. Even as our Lord suffered 
in order to save us from our sins. Glory is going to come. The presence of the Holy Spirit assures us of that. But only after we pass through a life of sorrow and struggle. This is God's way. This is the path that Christ walked. This is how he purifies us. This is how he prepares us. But in the meantime, as we struggle, as we battle, as we suffer, we remember that we are heirs to the promised inheritance. That we are royal children who can, care, who can cry out to our Creator and Redeemer whenever we need it. Our precious Father. Let's pray. Precious Father, we cry out to you now. We realize the, the life that we live is, is a struggle, it's a battle, it's not always easy. It's often filled with oh, temptations that seem to be overwhelming, with sin that just so easily entangles us, with trials and troubles uh, around us. Lord, we... We, we feel it even now as, as we've had to submit to some lockdowns and some different regulations. We feel our lives squeezed. And yet we know that you are in control, that you are our Heavenly Father, and that you are using all of our circumstances to bring us to glory. And that you await us at the end of our lives to give us everything in Christ. Lord, I pray that the truths that you've laid out today in this passage would be real to us, that we would have the mind that, that follows the Holy Spirit, consumed with the things of God, so that you would make us to see how beautiful our salvation is in Jesus Christ and how ugly sin is in comparison. Make us love you and hate sin. Lord, I pray that each one would be led by the Holy Spirit, would learn to love the means of grace, the preaching of the word, the meditation on the word, prayer, so that you can use those tools to root out sin in our lives. Lord, grow us and mold us and shape us into the image of our Savior for your glory. Amen.